the, the basic principle, regulatory principle, is we want a record of why you made these decisions. And it's a very, it's almost like, I think that the benefit of doing that is that it's like, you know, many investors talk about keeping a diary, uh, a personal diary or a personal journal. And this is kind of like an official journal, if you like, of what happened and why did you do it? And we see that this move was made in the portfolio, made this decision. Is there any kind of like backup for this? So in my case, I, I wrote my pre-trade check for, actually, we, we've modified it. I don't have to write it. I just have to record it. And then, and then we can use, uh, you know, um, Otter or similar to transcribe it. It gets edited lightly and we have a written record and there's a mark on a piece of paper that shows that. So I'd done the pre-trade check for the thing that I wanted to buy. And uh, I kind of said, look, we're, we're going to make this like 3 or 4% position and we're going to sell these things to do it, these smaller positions. And uh, the CFO came back to me and he said, look, the buy side is fine, but we need a little bit more. So then I said, okay, fine, I'll write it up. And I, I looked more closely at these smaller positions and I said, wait, wait a second, I don't, I don't want to sell this, this cheap. It's like, there's no, I'm, so we went back and instead of buying a 4% position, we bought, I believe, a 2% position and, and the, the balance is still to be bought. So yes, it acts as a kind of a check for mindless decisions, if you like. Now, there is an argument for saying that if it's such a small proportion of the portfolio, just clear it out. But at least then I would have to make that case. Yes, they're cheap, but there is a, there is a cost to us to monitoring these positions, and there's a mental energy that we're, in, we're investing that we no longer want to invest in them. Uh, but he stopped me, and I believe that that was the right thing to do at that. Or in a sense, he wasn't stopping me. He was saying, that's fine but I need to know why. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, uh, it's, it's delicate because, because somebody could say, damn it, I just want to do it. Or isn't it obvious why? And on the other side, um, you know, if somebody, I mean, William and I, I think I've figured out mainly through therapy sessions with Laurie, my wife, that if you're getting agitated, then the first thing we do when we get agitated is we want to think it's somebody else doing something to us. And they probably are doing something to us, but that's not the point. The point is what we're doing to ourselves. And so if I would have gotten agitated at that response, that in itself would have been something to pay attention to. I didn't get agitated. I was like, yeah, he's got a good point. And oh my God, check that out. No, I don't want to do that right now. So he's just saying, give me your reasons and make sure that the reasons are on paper. It also, for what it's worth from a governance standpoint, means that there are there are multiple eyes on these pre-trade checks or this investment official investment journal that also allows, for example, other staff in the office to say, yeah, this is going the way it ought to be going, or my gosh, there's something really weird going on here. I need to put some phone calls into our directors to say this, you know, he's, he's lost his marble, so to speak. So um, it's, it's a new world for me. I've been learning to live in that world, and it's been interesting for me to, to learn what I needed to become. Uh, but also the people around me have come to trust me. It took about, it's, it's, it's a slow process. And There's a beautiful line that I often quote, it sounds really pretentious, I often quoted it to my kids, Henry and Madeline, from um, Nietzsche, where he talked about how the, the genius dances within chains. And it's, it, I always talked about it in, in terms of, of literature, that it's kind of helpful to have certain rules and constraints, whether it's a a poet with certain types of, of meter or whatever. You think of Shakespeare having to write with iambic pentameters, right? It's like de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum. And yet somehow you can write amazing things within that rhyme scheme. And there's something about being regulated by the Swiss that it, it's chains, right? I mean, and yet somehow you can make it work for you yeah. by saying, well, actually, it's kind of helpful to have a circuit breaker that forces me in writing or in a dictation to explain why I would sell this position. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so, I, I'm not, I don't consider myself a creative guy, but it's, it seems to me the case that uh, actually, funny enough, William, with CC that you introduced me to, every time, you know, I have so much fun doing these holiday cards. And CC is a wonderful art director who, who was a great art director at Time, who I worked with for years and has been doing lots of design stuff for Guy, including the cover of the Educational Value Investor. Yeah, exactly. And sorry for, for not uh, explaining. 
And uh, with the holiday cards, every time what makes the holiday card, and I have so much fun with her, is that we have some powerful constraint so uh, that, that prevents us from doing what we'd originally thought. And then it's in the work of going around that constraint that uh, a really, really fun card comes out. So this idea of an iambic pentameter, how strange that actually having those constraints forces you to become um, the best version of yourself, perhaps. And yeah, so that I guess that's true uh, of the regulatory work. What I wanted to say is that, you know, there, look, what is it? It's one, a few times, many times this last few days, William, you've used the, the phrase, it's one damned relatedness after another. And the world is complicated. So uh, I used to love sort of like the distributed office. So, you know, uh, we, uh, we, we had a member of our staff in New York, we had a member of our staff in the BVI. But, but in responding to the new constraints, for example, from uh, regulatory constraints, working out new systems, uh, far better to be in one office because you want to have intense and regular conversations about how to make it work. And if you're in a different time zone and you're doing it over the phone, you kind of don't have enough opportunity to figure out that system. And so um, uh, I think that um, the, the regulatory constraints, those constraints provide the opportunity for outperformance or excelling in a certain way. Once you've kind of grasped them, you've engaged with them, and you're developing a rational response to them. At the same time, I feel like in the past, developing that response was made more difficult by the fact that we didn't have a full office day with all of the staff who were, and what I came to, and it's just coming to something very practical, which was that that needs to be worked out in one office, not, not in a distributed team. And I've become very leery eyed of people who say that they can work effectively in a distributed team across uh, sort of multiple time zones and, and large geographies. I think there's enormous benefit to being in one place. And when you're all in one place, your structures can evolve to changing circumstances, and when you're all distributed, they be kind of become ossified, especially people not at the center don't realize that the environment is changing and the way the team works needs to adapt. So uh, I, I know that's not a question that you posed to me, but uh, it came up for me and it was important for me to say it, and now you get to, William's looking at me in such a way, you're looking at me in such a way that goes, okay, now can we bring it, you've traveled off the reservation. What's I've, funny is Guy, Guy and I are both so unlinear that I, I, you know, I started this interview with about six or seven pages of questions and, and I immediately veered entirely into a totally different direction. Oh, so and, you did it, so, so that's fine. Yeah, no, so that's there's, something, there's something wonderfully uh, characteristic of Guy and my conversations where we'll literally talk for two days without having covered the thing that we meant to cover and then we'll get guilty and we'll uh, feel guilty and we'll come back to the main theme. So I did want to ask you about a, a very important topic that has been a really central part of our conversations over the last week, which is... This, by the way, is William bringing bring us back on track. And I just want you to know that I had various ways in which I could have taken it off track. I'm resisting mightily because they're so interesting. But go so ahead. far, you're resisting. <laughs> so a topic that's that's very central and important, I think, to a lot of our our listeners and viewers, is this whole game of long-term compounding. And Aquamarine, your fund, is a really interesting embodiment and illustration of, of this issue. So you set it up in September 1997. Um, so this is a little over 26 years ago. Over that period, you've averaged almost exactly 9% a year. This is through the end of, of um, 2023, exactly 9% a year. The, the S&P, I think, was, let me check, it was 8.3% annualized. The MSCI was 7.1%. So cumulatively, the fund has returned 874%. So it's about 157 percentage points ahead of the S&P, 371 percentage points ahead of the MSCI. So in some ways, it's a beautiful illustration of the power of long-term compounding. Like we, we were calculating this the other day, and we figured out that a million dollars invested at the start of that journey 26 years ago is now 9.4 million, right? So in some ways, it's an incredible example of the power of long-term compounding. And yet, there's also something deeply disappointing to you about it because you look back and you think, you know, when I started my career 26 years ago, 
and was influenced by Buffett. I thought I was going to make 15% a year, 20% a year. And here you are at 9% a year. And in some ways, it's a, it's a morality tale about disappointment. And in some ways, it's a morality tale about the incredible power of long-term compounding. Can you talk about how you've been thinking about this whole issue of the power of compounding, the power of good enough returns? Um, there's so much to discuss here. What, yeah. what does this bring up for you? So um, uh, the first thing that I can say is that, um, so it's, I, I think that the word that I used as I was making notes for before you came, William, is bittersweet. So it's sweet because it's compounding and it's bitter because it's not the number that I set out to achieve and it doesn't feed my ego in a great way. And I, I would say that the same way that we were talking about the financial crisis chapter, um, I, I knew I, I probably approached it in a defensive way anyway, because that's the nature of the human ego. But uh, I, I trusted, trust William enough to kind of bring that to you. And in a certain way, I'd say that this conversation, being willing to share it, is, is an act of sort of like, tell the truth, because you'll have a great adventure in life, something like that. If you want to live a meaningful life, certainly tell the truth. Um, and I'm, I'm brought back to a question that was asked to me by a very smart Google engineer at the talk that I gave at the invitation of Sarab Madan, where he said um, something along the lines of, and he, he probably kind of interrupted, he put his hand up in the first five minutes, and he kind of said something like, how do you know so you're so good? Uh, you seem to have beaten the market up to now, but maybe that's just luck. You know, and, and again, I had to be honest and say, well, we, we don't know, and I don't know. And um, so there's, there's all sorts of uh, 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 questions that I have about that. So one possibility is that uh, I'm an average investor who was lucky enough in the first few years to outperform the market, or I may be below average investor who was lucky enough to outperform the market for a while, has underperformed the market for a while, and actually, if we could look into the eyes of the Almighty, he will reveal that over the course of the fullness of time, I wasn't a great investor, or was a great investor. I don't know what the reality is. I wish I did. Uh, and so I have to operate within that uncertainty. And over above that, uh, within that uncertainty, I have to structure my own decisions and the decisions of the fund in such a way that given that I don't know what I really am like as an investor, and over above that, I don't know how reality will unfold, I want to position myself, and this is kind of a personal decision, such that no matter which one of those things is true, uh, I will come out in a good way on the other side. And so, um, you know, we could do a sort of matrix of many different possibilities. In one, I'm actually so there's also, referring back to a book of our friend Ken Schubenstein's that I believe you edited, you can have a good decision-making process in a specific, say, investment idea and get a bad result because the world unfolded in a different way. And that doesn't mean that your process was wrong. That just means that you got a bad result. By contrast, you can have a terrible decision-making process in a particular investment, make the decisions for all the wrong reasons, and end up with a spectacular result. And the idea that we have is somebody running with a match through a bomb factory. You might get through on the other side, but it might have exploded. So um, uh, I, I need to structure my decision making in such a way that given that, hu so, so I could be a good investor and the environment was not good for me. I could be a bad investor and the environment was not good for me. There's multiple different options. I need to take all of those into account uh, and all of the uncertainty about how the world unfolds and make decisions such that on the other side, there's a, there's a good life and a happy life. And, you know, we were I was talking yesterday to this, um, uh, this, this guy who's here at ValueX, who I think has got a wonderful book, Luca Delana on ergodicity. And we can ask the question, um, if you have the ambitions as a young person to be a movie star, you know, so you're focused on, I don't know, Natalie Portman or some other, Gwyneth Paltrow's had this super successful career, but you don't see all the people who started off 
who didn't have that super sex successful career, who were equally good actors and actresses, who were um, equally hardworking, equally talented, equally uh, face for cinema, and um, because the world is an extraordinarily random place. So the question becomes, if you're a person starting off in life, do, do you want to take the lottery ticket, the one in 10,000 or one in a million that you become, Gwyneth Paltrow, whoever else it is, are you also willing to live with all of the other outcomes that you might have? And, and I think that, you know, as long as you're happy, if you don't get that starring role and have that lucky thing that you get that career that you're dreaming of, you're also okay if it works out in a pretty boring way. You end up being a waitress your whole life or whatever else it is, then that's fine. But when I look at running Aquamarine Fund and looking at the financial affairs of myself, my family, our investors, an outcome where in some cases of the world, it's spectacular. But in other cases of the world, I blow up. Meaning, you know, and the, the kind of person, and there are stories like this of somebody that I know from the beginning of my career who put all of, all of his investors' assets into one stock, the stock was called MCF, and levered with the expectation that the price of gas would go from $2, from $4 to $8 to $12, except it went from $4 to $2. And he's no longer running a fund. That's not an acceptable outcome for me. All of that, because you feel like, and I'm going to bring this back to your original question, I believe, is to say that I don't, you know, so, so you don't want in the investing world, I believe, to say, I'm going to act in my portfolio in such a way that I can get my 18% annualized over the next 20 years and be super successful when in some proportion of the realities that may unfold, that turns into a great big zero, a la putting all of your investments in one stock and leveraging it. And so the strategies that get all of the potential outcomes to a decent result mean that you're far more likely, say, to get 9% rather than 12, 15, 20%. And so the sweet part of the bitterness is that survival is everything. Survival of the principle of compounding is everything. That is the most important thing, not the actual annualized rate of return. And yeah, if all other things being equal, I can double the rate of return or increase it by 2 or 3%, then that's fine, but they're not equal. And so I'm constantly saying to myself, and, and sometimes I look at it, and, and it's not a clear picture. So I can go back, and, and I'll hand the mic back to you in a second. I can go back into, so I had a bankruptcy embarrassingly enough in my portfolio in 2015. That was me acting with a certain proportion of the portfolio, about 10% of it, in a way that was not very smart. It was a bit like running with a lighted match through a bomb factory, and it didn't work out for me. And that's not the vast majority of the portfolio in my case, but every now and then I look at some positions uh, that maybe that they're great businesses, but they're very, very highly valued. And I ask myself, am I, am I actually doing a little bit of um, uh, you know, constructing the portfolio in such a way that it only works out great in certain versions of the world. And we want it to work out at least okay in all versions of the world. I think I'm kind of mincing my words a little bit, but I think, I think I've made the point probably too much. No, we're getting at something that's really profoundly important. And I've been, I've been struggling, to, <laughs> struggling to digest and synthesize this myself over the last few days, because I, I think it's vastly important. This idea, you know, so many people set up the horse race of investing where it's about, okay, I'm going to get these great returns and I'm going to beat the market. And, and for most of us, that's not really that important. Really what we want is to get to a position where we're financially secure, financially independent. It doesn't truly matter whether you beat the market by 150 points over the last 26 years, or 300 percentage points, or, or 20 percentage points, or if you, if you trailed, so long as it's like a really positive result that's getting us toward the finish line. And so I, I feel like what you've been working towards is this much greater clarity about the importance of compounding without catastrophe, long-term compounding without catastrophe. And I think one of the reasons you're so clear about this as a goal is that from the very start, um, a huge portion of the money in the fund 
and it was a tiny fund at the beginning. It was like a $20 million fund, right? With 14 million from your dad. And so it was like your dad's, all of the money that your dad had made in his entire career as an entrepreneur, basically, plus a few friends who, of his who were lawyers and stuff in Switzerland who might not have been invested in the market at all. And I was one of the first investors, like a little bit after that, probably a couple of years after that in around 1999. And so having done no due diligence, except had a few meals with you over the years. And um, so this priority of simply surviving, of getting to a good end point and compounding and staying in the market was hugely important to you. And I, I don't think this is something that most people think about. And I, it strikes me that just avoiding catastrophe and staying in the market, staying in the game, continuing to compound at a, at a decent rate, a good enough rate, it's underestimated. But then at the same time, there's a danger that money managers end up changing the game that they're playing, saying that that's the game they were playing just because they failed at the game of outperforming. That they wanted to play. I mean, what comes up for me and um, is an analogy that was so helpful for me. And it's funny because we happen to be at a ski resort and this is straight from Luca Delana's book. Uh, so he asks, so, you know, the name of the game, we're in, in the business of uh, skiing and being the most successful skier for the season. And obviously there are good skiers and we're now going to take the perspective of an individual skier who wants to win the season. And there are 10 races and, uh, you know, as the skier, he can he can ski. This is a downhill race. He can he can ski as fast as he possibly can, and there's a higher risk of uh, crashing and injuring himself. And uh, he can ski slower than his top speed, and he takes a higher risk of not winning that individual race, but he um, reduces the risk that he gets injured and get taken out of the race. And I'm not going to go through the probabilities, but. I think that we can all see and in, in the rush and the excitement of the day and the pressures that the skier feels, uh, there's, there's a tendency to want to push the uh, speed so that you can win the race. And the skier may doing that win races one, two, three, four, and five, but he's taking a cumulative risk there of injury. And as Luca puts it in the book, the skier that wins the race is not the fastest skier. It's the fastest skier that doesn't get injured. But the individual, and you've got an audience in there, it's super exciting to see the guy skiing super fast. And it's even more exciting in a way if you get a massive accident. But from the perspective of the skier, if you can just step back and say, my goal is to survive 10 races, uh, then he may ski differently. And so I think that this beautifully illustrates what we're trying to do as investors. And the pressure to try and win the individual race is just enormous. And this, by the way, is, is kind of like a, a rule for life in all sorts of things where what is short-term expedient, what feels like optimal in the day is not optimal for the week, the year, and, and many years. So, uh, and just to take it to an investing uh, um, example, uh, there I am at the... Um, Oh man, it's a famous hotel in uh, Manhattan. I don't know why. I always want to remember these things with the specific place. It's the Waldorf Astoria and White Mountains Insurance is giving a presentation and Jack Byrne is the CEO and uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway has funded White Mountains Insurance to buy a uh, distressed insurance company, which is probably at half or less of book value. And now, while the whole thing is still trading at less than half of book value, White Mountains Insurance is doing an equity issuance. And Jack Byrne, who's re-domiciled this company to Bermuda, is standing there in Bermuda shorts. And I'm there as a young whippersnapper after the presentation for the issuance and wants to ask him a question. I say, but Jack, it's trading at such a discount. These, this share issuance is dilutive. Uh, we will make so much more money if you don't do this share insurance. Why are you doing it? And 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 he he basically he looked at me with these kind eyes. And and you know I, we've talked about uh, um, his name escapes me. This kind of like you know I mean I'm just a nothing to him and just like total focus on me. And he says um, this uh, yes, if the world works out perfectly, we would have left money on the table. 
But if the work world works out really badly, doing this equity assurance ensures that the company will survive and do just fine. And I want you to know, Guy, that this issuance has the blessing of our friend in Omaha, Warren Buffett. And it's just an example of, of you know, Warren saying, don't race as fast as you can. The name of the game is to finish the season. Don't take the risk by not issuing equity that you might not finish the season. Let's issue the equity. Yes, we're going to be going a bit slower, but we will definitely finish the season no matter how the world unfolds. So that's an example of that. And I would just tell you that as I say it, I think of the decision that I made uh, to stick around in, um, uh, in Horsehead, which ended up as a bankruptcy. And in that case, the equivalent analogy in White Mountains is that I didn't do the equity issuance because like, I wanted to make as much money as I possibly can. And so that the desire to do that, even with a part of the portfolio, is very, very high. And what I learned from that moment and from reading Luca Delana and you know, understanding his skiing analogy and seeing the decision that Warren Buffett made is that almost in all circumstances, don't do that. You know, and, and it came up at the most recent Berkshire Hathaway meeting. I don't know who I was talking to, but somebody was pretty close to the decision making in Kiewit Plaza. And they said, uh, you cannot imagine how much of Warren, how much time Warren spends just thinking about the downside. This came up in my conversation with Chris Davis, who, who had, um, who's now on the board of Berkshire. And if you want to check this, this is a fascinating part of the, the recent podcast that I did with Chris where I asked him what it was like to be in a board meeting with Buffett and Munger, and he was saying, you wouldn't believe how much time Buffett spends talking about the most extreme circumstances that he's guarding the portfolio against, making sure that the company would be okay in the event of, uh, you know, nuclear attacks, financial crises, um, you know, dirty bombs, whatever, whatever it might be. I thought that was a really interesting insight that that, that focus on resilience. But what's interesting is Buffett has this ability both to set things up to be incredibly resilient and then to make these incredibly bold, racy bets on things like American Express where he put a huge... So he's one of those rare creatures who can kind of do both, but I don't think, I don't think, I don't think almost anyone else can, right? Take that sort of intense... Uh, Joe Greenblatt did the same thing. Yeah. It's, it's true. I think also Warren did it at a different point in his life. I don't think he'd do that now, if he, even if he could. He probably can't now anyway, because it, it's, it's just fascinating. Because in, in Warren's case, 40% of his portfolio in American Express and, um, you know, salad oil scandal and uh, uh, in, a, in a way a controversial situation. I talked about that sort of controversy. I don't like, there was controversy around it. I mean, uh, in a way, American Express's name was dirt. And the ability to say, actually, yes, in financial circuit, circles, perhaps, but as a consumer brand, it's absolutely fine and it will succeed and survive. And he actually, what he told, I, I'm going to get the details wrong, but he kind of said to American Express, look, it doesn't really matter who's at fault here. Just pay them out, get this behind you, and you'll do fine. Even if you weren't at fault at all here, you just want to get this behind you because your business will be great and you can afford to do the payout. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not that smart. <laughs> I'm not that able to, to, to do that kind of thing, it seems to me. I also don't know to what extent, I mean, just rewinding slightly, um, the, 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 and the way in which one gets started. So in my case, if I could have, I, I'm very grateful to be doing what I'm doing. I'm extraordinarily grateful to my father. I'm grateful that he made the decisions that he did. If I wanted to be... Um, if I if I could like have my past again, I think that I would have liked to have seen how things would have unfolded if my father had, instead of dumping the whole of his liquid net worth into me, had said, look, I'm going to dribble it out X amount at a time. You know, you know, the, the my liquid net worth, the vast majority of it is extremely safe and you can have oversight over that. And you're going to work on growing a small chunk of it at a high rate and I will add over time as we get more confident in it. So that I, I would have, I think I would have been more willing to take bigger bets at the time. And what happened with me is, I mean, I was given, it was, it was 14 million from these three different investor accounts that came in. 
and like like fifty percent of it was in bonds for like five years because I was so super scared. And when I went and bought my first stock for the portfolio, Duff and Feltz, even my father was disappointed by how little I put into it. Mm. But out of fourteen million, actually, I put about two quarter of a million into Duff and Phelps and made seven times my money. You know, instead of putting say a million in and making seven times my money, which is by the way all in the track record. It's like I've not varnish that in any way shape or form there's nothing that's been taken out some people might have said oh but let's remove the cash and just see the performance of the equities i didn't do any of that